Hello, today we're going to be talking about moments of inertia via composite parts and the parallel axis theorem. Um, so, <clears throat> as an alternative to the integration method, which is talked about earlier, uh, we can also use something known as the, uh, you can use composite bodies or areas to find uh, these moment, uh, moments of inertia. Uh, these can be either area moments of inertia or mass moments of inertia. There's only a small difference in how you calculate this. Um, so in this way we can skip the integration, which is a, a kind of a tedious part of a lot of these calculations, and instead we're going to use the works of, works of others uh, in these tables as a shortcut. Alright, so the overall process to do this calculation is as follows. Uh, we're going to start by taking our composite body or volume, breaking it down into simple shapes, and those simple shapes are ones we can look up in our tables that are available to us. Once we do that, we're actually going to look up the moments of inertia for each individual shape um, using the moment of inertia tables. And we're going to plug in things like you know, height, radius, distance, uh, etc. Um, <clears throat> after that, we're going to choose some overall combined um, origin point where we're going to take the moment of inertia about. And the problem with our original data is each individual part has its own origin point. So we need to use the parallel axis theorem to adjust those origin points so that they all line up to be a single point. Once we have adjusted those values, we can simply add the moments of inertia together for the parts, and the sum of all the parts is going to be equal to the moment of inertia of our whole body there. All right, so going back to step one, so the first step in finding the combined moment of inertia is to break our complex shape uh, down into simple shapes that are in our moment of inertia table. So I've got an area here, a volume here. Uh, so something like this area, I might start by saying, you know, there's a semicircle over here. I've got semicircles in my table. Uh, shape two, I might say there's this big square right here. And then shape three, I can actually do a negative shape. I'm going to cut off a triangle. And so this triangle or this the, any hole or cutout or kind of missing piece, we're going to count that as a negative area or a negative mass in our calculations. And so shape two, I've got a volume over here. I've got a cone on top of something like a cylinder. I add the cone and cylinder together to get my kind of like rocket shape uh, in this case. All right, so step one, break it down into separate bodies. Step two is going to be to look up values in the table. So you've got your mass moment of inertia tables or your area moment of inertia tables that are available to you. And you're going to work, want to record several things from those tables. So we want to record the area and or mass for each component depending on what type of moment, integral, moment of inertia you're doing. You want to record the location of the origin point used in each shape. And so in those tables, it's going to have kind of x and y axes, and you want to kind of basically record where are the x and y axes in the table, and how does this line up? And so something like a circle, it'd just be the center of the circle. This rectangle would be the center of the rectangle. Uh, something like a triangle, it's a third of the way from the kind of square end here, so it'd be somewhere around here. But we need to use some uh, composite axes, so I'm just going to say x and y right there, and so I find the x and y location of the that origin point for shape one, shape two, and shape three, and record those values in my table. And I also record the moments of inertia uh, for each of my parts. And so, for example, a <clears throat> shape one is a rectangle. The moment of inertia is going to be one twelfth base times height cubed. Uh, for the ix value. Uh, it's going to be something different possibly for the iy. Um, <clears throat> and so I want to kind of plug in values for base, plug in values for height, and record kind of these values unadjusted in another separate line there. Um, <clears throat> and finally, kind of goes without saying here, uh, it may be useful to start recording this data in a table. I find that's the easiest way uh, to keep track of everything is to put everything, I've got shape one, shape two, shape three, you know, centroid area for each part, centroid location, X and Y, 
this is the unadjusted moments of inertia, uh, and so on. All right, so when you do this, uh, the tables are a little bit tricky uh, because they're not always going to perfectly match with what you have. So an example of this is my semicircle. So my semicircle for shape one over here is kind of on its side, but if I go and <clears throat> look up this value in the table, I've got a semicircle where the flat part is the base, and so this is a 90 degree offset basically between what I see here and what I see here. And so one thing you need to do is you need to kind of think about the orientation. And so if I need to rotate it by 90 degrees, um, I basically have flipped the x and y axes. And so for ix, I would actually look at the iy values. And that for iy, I would look at the ix values. They happen to be the same formula here, but if you've got this kind of 90 degree rotation, you're going to kind of flip those x and y moments of inertia. Another important thing to look at um, is the origin point, like I said before. And so the origin point, I've got ix and iy. I've also got an x prime, which is going through the centroid here, but I'm using these formulas up here. So the centroid is at the base of my semicircle, and so my centroid location would be this point right here. So it'd be zero in the y direction, but some value, whatever one radius of my semicircle is in the x direction. So that's the point that I'm looking at for these x bar and y bar values uh, in my table. Uh, and I've listed them as x bar and y bar because normally for a lot of shapes, these are going to be the centroid locations themselves is where we put the origin. All right, so next we need to adjust those axes. Um, so we're eventually going to be adding everything together, uh, kind of combining them all to find the overall moment of inertia. But we have a problem right now in that each shape, and so looking back at this, this is the, the kind of point I'm using for my semicircle. For my square, it's going to be right in the center down here. And for shape three over here, it's going to be kind of down here. So each moment of inertia has a separate point um, that's used as that, um, <clears throat> as the origin point. So we need to adjust it. So we have a common single point to look at. So we want a single point, uh, and generally this is gonna be the centroid of the shape or the center of mass of the shape. Um, we wanna adjust the moments of inertia using what's known as the parallel axis theorem so that all of the moments of inertia are about that same point. And the way we do that is with this formula. So the ix value, the moment of inertia about the x-axis for any point, is going to be ix about the centroid plus this ar squared term. And we've got the same thing, we can do the same thing with mass moments of inertia except rather than area, we're going to be using masses. So this is why I can combine these two together is they're really the same process, we just have one term that's different between the two of them. All right, so <clears throat> Area moment of inertia about any point P. Area moment of inertia about the centroid. Uh, and this is going to be the centroid or whatever we look up in our table. And we need to add on this A R squared term. And so this A is the area of the shape. And then the R term is the distance between the two axes. So this is the X axis going through the centroid. This is the X axis going through my new point P. And that distance between the two axes is my r squared term. So we see the same thing down here. Uh, like I said, the only difference is I'm using the mass of the part rather than the area of the shape. All right, so this r value, so this is maybe the centroid and this is the y axis going through my centroid. What would I do to find the r values? Well, for like shape one, the origin point for my semicircle was the base right here. So this is the y-axis going up through that point. This is the y-axis I'm using. This is the, the big black point here is the central point that I've chosen. Um, and so that distance between those two, that would be my r term, my correction term for shape one. For shape two, uh, I've got the center of the square, which is a little bit offset from this yc, that's r2. 
and R3, this is the center uh, of my triangle going up that way. I've got some bigger distance R3 there. And so each little part is going to have a different R value that we plug into that kind of correction term. The A R squared or the M R squared terms. Um, and what you should see with this is actually <clears throat> the, the smallest moment of inertia uh, mass moment or area moment for a shape is going to be the moment of inertia about the centroid. The further I move from that, the bigger I make my R values, uh, the bigger my moment of inertia becomes. All right, so once I've corrected all these with this A R squared or M R squared terms, that's the last, these are the R terms right here, and these are the original moments of inertia that I got from my tables plus m r squared or r squared, I correct it, I add on some values, and so now I've got a new corrected version that's all about some central point. And the last step is once I have these corrected values all about the same point, I can simply add them together. The sum of the moment, corrected moment of inertia for one, two, and three is going to be the moment of inertia of my composite area um, for I can add together all the X ones for my IX, add together all the Y ones for my IY, and so on. Uh, so with that, that's all I have for this video. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again.